My name is Lori Lee Triplett, and I'd like to introduce you to the latest of the Poos Collection books, Pioneer Quilts. Now, as you know, my sister and I have written these books together, but this book has a special treat for you. We introduce you to a woman called Esther Heinzman, the quilt treasurer. She wonders who will treasure her quilts in the future. I think she'd be pleased to know that Kay Triplett was treasuring her quilts. My name is Esther Heinzman, and I'm the quilt treasurer. I homesteaded out on the plains with my husband for many a year. Oh, I just love the prairie. The sound of that wind blowing over the plains or, or the sound and the feel of a thunderstorm moving in. That's not to be missed. Even after my husband died, I didn't see any reason to give up my sod house. It wasn't until later that I realized that feeding the livestock in the middle of a blizzard had gotten to be too much for me. So I moved in to the big city. We have 11 buildings now. And I live at the boarding house. And that's where I got my name for the quilt treasurer because, well, I love quilts. Now, I get my quilts in a variety of different ways. Sometimes someone just gives me the quilt because they know I'll take care of it. Other times, people have had such a hard time there giving up their homestead and going back east. So I might buy their quilt and give them a little money for the trip. And sometimes when people are on the wagon train and on the Santa Fe Trail, the load is too heavy. So they have to discard some items. So I've found some quilts that way. <laughs> there is no quilt that I wouldn't keep, even those that might be past their life expectancy, like I am. But enough about me. Let's talk about quilts. Now, once the families have made the difficult decision to head out for the plains or wherever their wagon train is going, they realize they have to say goodbye to their friends and family. They're very limited on what they can take, so things need to serve multiple purposes. And so a friendship quilt was a perfect way to do that. That way, people could sign their names or they could be stitched in. And every time you looked at that quilt, you could remember your uncle or your friend. Now, this friendship quilt is from 1856. It's from a Huguenot family. Those are French Protestants. And I have this quilt because the younger son moved to Nebraska to set up a homestead. It's one of my finer pieces. I got it from a peddler, a sort of seller of quilts. After they made the decision to go on the tr big, difficult journey, then they had to pick and choose what they would take. Sometimes each one would, would sell all of their belongings to make it lighter and easier to go. Other times they made the difficult decisions on, on what would be packed in their wagon. Two books almost always made it on the trip. The most often book was the Holy Bible. And the second book was Pilgrim's Progress. That's where the name of this quilt, Delectable Mountains, comes. It comes from the eighth chapter and talks about the mountains that the Lord will provide comfort and protection. You can see how that would be a comfort on your journey. 
once we reached the plains, we began to realize that, that some of the quilt patterns we were used to calling by certain names didn't mean as much to us. Well, this, the mariner's compass, for example, well, sea was thousands of miles away and most of us had to walk. So that was 15 miles a day walking. You were quite a ways from the ocean. We made just a little change to that pattern and all of a sudden we had sunburst. And the sun is something we could all relate to every day out on those plains. Now this woman, her quilt sunburst and lily, she combined with what some people call the Carolina lily pattern, but we just called it lily, and lilies were vital on the plains. Sometimes when nothing else would grow and you were desperate for food, the Native Americans had shown us how to go out there and dig up lily bulbs and make a lily bulb soup. Have you ever had lily bulb soup? It's an acquired taste. I never did acquire it. In more pleasant times, we would have uh, get-togethers to do barn raisings or help build a house if you were lucky enough to decide to build a house out of wood instead of a sod house. And then all the neighbors would come together and we'd each bring some sort of food, like maybe a cake, and we'd put it on a cake stand. Bring that. That was a fairly popular pattern until 1876, when the Philadelphia Exposition had what was known as a cakewalk dance. And they won this big white cake sitting on this beautiful cake stand. Well, after that, cakewalks became the fastest fundraiser in town. I'm sure many of you have participated in that. And that increased the number of quilts that we saw using the cake stand pattern. I should probably also mention to you about little crib quilts. This double patch a uh, double four patch crib quilt is such a treasure. You know, on the plains, you use everything that you can and you hand it down. So it's not just one child that gets to use a crib quilt. Well, it might be used by every child in the family. Unless, unfortunately, the child didn't make it. And then sometimes you'd wrap those up and the baby's up to have them buried in that comforting quilt. So crib quilts are pretty rare in the, out here. So this one is a special treasure for me. And I'm so glad I have it in my collection. I actually have two crib quilts. I also have this nice one. And this quilt artist was so careful to make sure that the diamonds and the squares. She didn't ever have two of them alike. And then I also have this little doll quilt. Oh, do you know that some of those fabrics in there are hand dyed by things on the plains like walnuts or pokeberries? Again, we used whatever we could find. Well, those are just a few of my treasures. I hope that you will come to appreciate quilts as much as I do. I'm, I'd sure like to know what would happen to these quilts in the future. Perhaps some other quilt treasurer will get a hold of them.